There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And regardless of some of the struggles or a, a painful phase of your life, probably all of us at some point in our childhood or our adulthood have uttered those words that there's no place like home. In the classic, The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy repeatedly says that phrase over and over again. But it's more than just a line in a movie. Maybe you said it upon returning from a mission trip and when you landed in America, you thought there's no place like home. Perhaps you whispered it after a, a hospital stay that lasted a lot longer than it should have. Or maybe when you carried your luggage in and you hugged a family member and then you just fell back on your bed and with relief you made that statement. My daughter Sadie celebrated her one year wedding anniversary last week and she and Aaron for 11 of the past 12 months have lived in hotels for 320 days. They have been in hotels spanning eight countries and 10 United States cities. They have no home. And it's tough to get much traction when you are somewhere for just a few days or a few weeks. And many days they would tell you that it's tough to feel at home when you find yourself in a location where you feel more like a stranger or you feel like an outsider. And some of you can relate to those feelings even though your job doesn't cause you to travel. And you long for a real home because you know in your heart that when things are, are right, then there's no place like home. Now I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to figure out what the answer is for you. You're the only one that can answer this question, all right? How many homes have you lived in in your entire life? Now, we will constitute living in a home if you live there for more than two months, all right? So you have to kind of walk your way through, feel free to use your fingers or your toes, whatever you need to, all right? I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. You can consult a family member nearby if, if need be. For some of you, this will be very easy. My wife lived in the same house for the first 20 years of her life, okay? For others of you, this will be an algebraic equation, all right? So you got 30 seconds, we'll play some music. 30 seconds to figure it out. Okay, you got five seconds. Okay, your time is up. At every one of our campuses, I'm gonna count one, two, three, and you holler out what your number is. Are you ready? One, two, three. Wow, okay. I heard a variety of numbers. Uh, how many of you, I had 13. How many of you all had, uh, more than 13, okay? How many of you all had over 20? Anybody have over 30? Yeah? On the run from the law is what that means, okay? <laughs> Anybody have two or less? Wow, that's, that's awesome, that's, that's great. Uh, home is the anchor of our souls. It's the rudder of our lives. When you think about it, when we have some place that we call home, uh, there's security in that. So where's your home? We're in a series where we are studying the, the book of, of 1 Peter. And if you turn to the back of your Bible and you find the last book of Revelation, just come a few pages before that and you'll land in 1 Peter. We're in a series, Finding Hope in a World of Hurt. And in the 60s AD, Peter writes to a dispersed, persecuted group of Christ followers who are in the midst of suffering and intense challenges in order to remind them of their true home. You see, there's great hope when you are home. And that's the takeaway that I want you to embrace today. There's great hope when you are home. In Philippians chapter three, verse 20, it reminds us, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. And so we draw hope from our living hope and the fact that he will someday take us to where we belong. 
So today what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to answer three different questions. One, where is our home? Two, how can we have a hope? And three, why should we live distinctive lives? And we talked last week about Jesus Christ being our living hope. And that same passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you want to look at it with me, 1 Peter chapter 1 talks about where our home is. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. We talked last week about how it is guarded in heaven for you is the word that's used there. So to begin, where is our home? And we honestly have a couple of answers as to where is our home. First, it's on earth temporarily. This is where we live temporarily until we, we, we pass away. You'll recall what John chapter 1 verse 14 says. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And I've always loved the way the message paraphrases John 1.14. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. That's what Jesus did. He came to us to set us an example for living in this fallen world. And according to 1 Peter, Christians, while on earth, we are, we are strangers, we're aliens. Look at verse 17 of, of 1 Peter 1. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. And the word here for foreigner or for alien, it, it means one who lives in a place that is not his true home. And at times, we, we do feel like an outsider. You ever felt like a, a stranger that doesn't belong? Sometimes if I, if I walk into a weight room and a lot of people are, are lifting big, heavy weights, I, I kind of I feel like a stranger and an alien in that setting. Uh, sometimes when I'm at a, a, a dinner meeting and there's six people there and they're all just brilliant, I, I feel rather awkward in those conversations. But at times the uncomfortableness comes from the fact that we are surrounded by people who are very far away from God and they have no desire to draw close to him. And we all know what that feels like and we've all experienced that, whether it was in another country, in another setting, whether it was at a, a, a neighborhood block party, at an office uh, get-together, maybe even when it was at one of your family reunions. Because for some of you, your Christian beliefs compared to those of your extended family are so different than yours. And the only thing that you have in common is a last name. And yet we're called to reach out to those who don't know Christ and, and to introduce them to Christ. And the Bible says that what Christians will experience is that we won't feel like this world is our home. And we'll feel out of place at times. It's like living in a cheap motel while you wait for your house to be built. So where is your home? It's on earth temporarily, but it's in heaven eternally if you're a Christian. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14, it says this, For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. And this temporary existence on earth, this home, this, this world has been lost, it's been corrupted, it's broken, we live in a fallen world, and it's a house where we experience grief and frustration. And therefore, Jesus invites us to be reclaimed by him and to be renewed and restored back to the wholeness when we originally were designed by him. And we will receive a glorified body someday in heaven, and everything will be transformed and changed. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Later on in verse 8, it says, We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So heaven will be home. Heaven will have the same architect as our, our earthly home here on earth. And in fact, the Bible indicates that our eternal home in heaven won't be some cloud in the sky that you live on. It will actually be this earth, only it's been renewed and filled with the presence of God. 
And he's been working on it for over 2,000 years. And someday it will come down and it will take the place of earth. And it will feel like home to the Christian. Because you were created in the image of God. And God is there. And everything will be perfect. And I mean everything. When I was six years old, my, my teenage uncle went through a series of tests. He had been born with cerebral palsy. The doctors had, had just determined that my uncle Greg would never be able to walk. And although I, I don't remember the conversation, uh, being only six, my mom later wrote about that day when her worst fears were confirmed about her brother and she read the doctor's prognosis. My mom wrote these words. She said, Dave came into the room while I was reading the letter from my mom and I was crying. And seeing my tears, he said, what's wrong, mommy? I said, well, I just got a letter from your grandmother and it says that the doctors have determined that Uncle Greg will never be able to walk. Never, Dave asked. Never, I responded. Not even in heaven, Dave asked. Oh, yes. I smiled. Yes, Uncle Greg will be able to walk in heaven. And Dave looked up at me and said, then we'll wait. And Mom wrote, on that day, I was thankful for a six-year-old who helped me to regain my equilibrium. And so we waited. We waited for over 40 years. And then our waiting ended and his walking began. And I wonder if for the past eight months, my mom and my uncle have gone on a walk or a run together each day. See, heaven has a way of transforming whatever your disability is, whatever your personal struggle is. In heaven, that's all gone. Whatever your affliction is, whatever your, your turmoil that you're in. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, it says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's your home. That's your inheritance where the Christian will live for all eternity. And if you're a Christian, then life in this world is the closest you will ever come to experiencing hell. But if you aren't a Christian, then this world is the closest that you will ever come to experiencing heaven. And you need to know that. Well, where is our home? Second question is, how can we have hope? And Peter is going to remind us that first of all, our hope is found in who we are through Christ. That's our identity. So that we can experience hope in this world of hurt. Look at the next chapter over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and look at verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now remember that, that Peter is writing to Christians who have been scattered. They've been on the run because they're under persecution. And that phrase where it says, you are, are God's special possession. Your version might say that you are a people belonging to God. This is a reference back to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus. And he's showing how, even in the New Testament now, these Gentiles who weren't Jewish growing up, they were Gentiles who have become Christians, they can share in the implication of God's covenant with Israel. What he's saying is this, your past heritage need not affect your present relationship with the Lord. God is not concerned with your past. God is not always bringing it up to you. Satan is bringing it up to you. And what matters in God's eyes is the present and the future. And the phrase where, where Peter says he's called you out of darkness into your wonderful light, that's the exact same wording that's used back in the book of Exodus to describe the Jewish people when they were saved from slavery. They were brought from darkness into light. Look at the next verse, verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When you accept Christ, you now have an identity because you are a part of his family. And your family on this earth may be dysfunctional, they may be discouraging, 
but being an heir to God's imperishable inheritance and being a part of his family gives you hope and it gives you meaning. It gives you grace and mercy. So how do I live a life of hope that communicates my home is in heaven even while I'm on earth and I'm being bombarded by my boss and by the world and by a setting that tries to chip away at my spiritual beliefs? Well, it begins with knowing who you are in Christ. And it continues by knowing how to live in Christ. I like it when I receive clear instructions or clear direction and somebody says, this is what I want you to do. Uh, my mom, uh, when, when she was alive, she gave our family some of the most thoughtful gifts that you could ever imagine. But you also need to know that my mom gave us some of the strangest gifts that you could ever imagine. Uh, she would worry incessantly about her kids. And, and if I were your son, you would worry about me too, right? But years ago, she watched a commercial about a product that was a plastic hammer with a metal tip on it. And the commercial showed a car, a guy driving along the road, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, he makes a turn and he goes into a lake. And the car starts sinking down in the water. And you look and say, oh, how's this guy going to get out? Well, he can't open his door. His power windows won't work. What's he going to do? As he goes underwater, he calmly reaches in his glove compartment and he pulls out an orange plastic hammer <laughs> with a metal silver tip on it. And he goes like this a couple of times and the window shatters and he calmly swims out to safety. <laughs> and my mom watched this commercial and all she could do was worry about her family. And so she bought for her sons, their wives, and for every grandchild who was over the age of 16, <laughs> this orange hammer. And for the next few years, whenever we would be leaving a family gathering, my brother and I would, in a very loud voice, we'd say to each carload, now, uh, will any of you be traveling over any water anywhere? And we would go on and on. The other one would say, does everybody have their orange hammer either in their pocket or laying right there on their dashboard? And uh, my mom would just look at us and say, you boys are terrible, and walk off, you know? <laughs> and just shake her head at us. I, I realized, I was showing this to somebody in between hours, not only does it have the metal tip to break the window, it has a blade, and you can cut your seatbelt if you can't get out of your seatbelt, okay? <laughs> so this, they've, they've thought of everything, right? That's just the way my mom was, too. One year for Father's Day, she gave me a set of auto shades for Father's Day. You know what auto shades are? You know what auto shades? It's the things that you unfold and you put them inside of the windshield of your car so that in the summertime when everybody else's car on the inside is 98 degrees, not you, 96. <laughs> <laughs> because your mom gave you auto shades, right? Okay? But I'll never forget when she gave them to me. She said, now make certain you read the instructions. Make certain you read the instructions. Okay. Here's the instructions. Number one, unfold auto shades inside the car. Gotcha. Number two, push the cutout portion behind the rear view mirror. That's good. Number three, pull the sun visors down to hold the auto shades in place. But number four, warning, do not drive car with auto shades in place. <laughs> I mean, is that really necessary? Did they start having problems with that? Yeah, I need some backup over here. Yeah, four cars at a stop sign. Yeah, you got all wearing their auto shades. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> now, instructions seem simple at times, but we like it when we get them because it allows us to know what we're supposed to do. And what Peter is going to do in 1 Peter 2 is he's going to give us some simple instructions that can help you live with hope while in a world of hurt, a world where you feel like an outsider at times. So he starts in verse 11, and number one, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. So he says, avoid earthly lusts. That starts with guarding your mind by being careful of the things that you view or see or read. Be careful of the conversations that you have. Next instruction, verse 12. 
live such godly lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. And the readers of this letter had been displaced, they had been slandered, they had been marginalized, and yet Peter says to them, live such a life of reproach that even those who accuse you of wrongdoing will see and sense that there's something distinctive about you. How do you respond when when the server messes up your order? How do you care for people that everyone else just overlooks? How do you treat someone when you have been treated unfairly by them? And all of these things are chances and opportunities you have to abstain from sinful desires and temptations and bring a taste of heaven to earth which could only come from God. One way he suggests that is through your good deeds. You may not know it, but there were two great plagues which swept through the Roman Empire in the early years of Christianity. One of them took place in A.D. 165 and the other in A.D. 251. And in both cases, one-third of the population of the Roman Empire were wiped out. And most citizens tried to avoid contact with a person who had the plague. I mean, it makes sense. You don't want to become infected by it, and you don't want to become contaminated and spread it to your loved ones. And there were stories about people who would take sick people out and literally throw them in the gutter and leave them there to die so that they wouldn't have to come near those people and risk getting the disease themselves. And the wealthy people, the wealthy people, they fled the city and they went and they set up another home and something happened. When they left, the Christians chose to stay. And they were the only ones who stayed. And they tried to nurse these people back to health because love was the calling card of the Christian. And I'll bet they had a pretty responsive audience when they shared their faith in Jesus with those who were sick. Historian Will Durant wrote about it. He said, never had the world seen such a dispensation of alms as was now organized by the church. She helped widows, orphans, the sick, prisoners, and victims of natural catastrophes. She frequently intervened to protect the lower orders from unusual exploitation. So there was a time in the history of the church when that was the norm for the church. And I believe it can happen again, and I believe that it can happen with you and with me. I got an email a few weeks ago from a host home of one of our college-age Bible studies, and, and the hostess shared this said, at our Bible study last night, a girl excitedly wanted to share that, that they had called a plumber to fix their sink at home. And her brother and dad left to go get takeout from a restaurant for their dinner. And before they left, they asked the plumber if if he'd like something to eat. And when they returned, they they gave the the plumber his meal. And he asked, do you all go to Southeast Christian? And they said, well, yes, we do. And the plumber said, I thought so. Every person who offers me something to eat always goes to Southeast Christian. (laughs) Now, I love stories like that because it shows that many of you are living distinctive lives and you are loving where you are. You know, centuries ago, Christians changed the world by how they served. But it doesn't have to start with something big. It starts with something small. You buy someone lunch. You sit with a co-worker who is sick in, in the hospital with them. You pray for a neighbor And your good deeds become contagious, and what ends up happening is there's this movement that changes an entire nation. Look at the next instruction, verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Do you know what that passage means in our context It means that we are to submit or honor whoever wins the election. And many believers are worrying and fretting about the condition of our country and its future. I understand that. But as Christians, we don't need to wring our hands. We need to hit our knees. 
And we need to earnestly pray for discernment and for wisdom and for boldness in our faith. What might happen if all of us began to pray for the candidates and for their hearts to be receptive to God's leading and direction? I mean, it couldn't hurt. Verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. So we silence the critics by serving others, and we live a life of freedom, not permissiveness, which sees grace as a license to sin, but rather as an opportunity to live distinctive lives of faith and of freedom, not out of duty, but out of devotion. Not out of obligation, but as a demonstration of the Christ whom we love. And this how-to list of instructions concludes with a summary verse in verse 17. Peter says, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. Now that's really bold, and it would have raised the eyebrows of the readers. Honor the emperor, who at the time was Nero? who was killing Christians. And if you are reading this as an early New Testament Christian, you're thinking, whoa, we got a copy with a misprint in it. It says to honor the emperor, but know they are to show honor to him because of the leadership role that he has been entrusted. Acts 5 teaches us to obey earthly leaders except when it goes against God's commands for us. And Peter makes it crystal clear to his readers that they are to live a strong Christian life in the midst of these communities that that don't worship Christ. And he paints the picture that Christians are exiles, that they are strangers, that they are outsiders in this world. And our response to that shouldn't be that we act with a comeback of rebellion or of hatred or of finger pointing or of anger. No. He says our response should be that we are known for our genuine love for our gracious words, for our respectful spirit, for our bold faith, that we trust that God is able in the midst of these circumstances, that God is big enough and he is strong enough and he is powerful enough to make something good come out of this, out of our suffering. We've seen where our home is and how we must live. And you might be listening and you might be wondering, well, why? Why should I live a distinctive life? Why would I need to live such a countercultural existence and invite ostracism and ridicule during my time on earth? And the answer is found a little bit later in this same passage because Peter points us toward the example of the one whom we are trying to imitate. And you think about all of the suffering that, that Jesus went through. Pick it up in verse 21. To this you were called... Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds." You have been healed. And Jesus faced suffering. And he didn't deserve it. And yet by his wounds, we are healed. And his life was controlled and marked by love through everything he did. Whether he was encouraging the immoral to change. Or healing the disabled. Or touching a leper. Or feeding a hungry crowd. Or remaining silent before a governor when he could have defended himself or staying on a cross when he could have come down. Hey, Jesus took love where you are to a whole nother level. See, his attitude was we don't repay evil for evil. We keep loving others so that we can connect people to him, to one another. And here at Southeast, we believe that connection becomes more possible when they have seen someone who lives and loves the way that Jesus Christ does. 
Earlier in this message, you had to determine how many homes that you've had. Whatever your total number was that you came up with, if you are a Christ follower, I want you to add one to your count. Because even though you aren't home yet, it belongs to you, and it belongs to you now, and it will be there for you. God promises that. Heaven is yours. And because of the reality of that plus one, you should live in your temporary home on earth with the confidence and assurance of an eternal home in heaven if you're a follower of Jesus. A home that will never perish or spoil or fade. You see, the moment you add one to your count, you are adding hope. And you can face anything in this world of hurt because you have a heavenly home and inheritance made possible by Jesus Christ. For you see, the God of the universe left heaven and he came to earth and he lived a perfect life because he knew that, that we couldn't. And he became a sacrifice on the cross for us. And he died in order for us to, to have our sins paid for. But on the third day, he exited his own grave. And he's gone back to heaven to prepare a home for you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus left heaven and came to earth. In other words, Jesus moved into your neighborhood and if you put your trust in him, then someday you can move into his neighborhood. Let's pray. Father, we look forward to uh, spending eternity with you in heaven. And when Christians are in the presence and company of Jesus Christ, I'm sure that we will say, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. In the meantime, Lord, will you help us to uh, know exactly how to live so that we can set an example, whether it means that we suffer, whether it means that we face trials or challenges, whether it just means at times feeling like an outsider, will you help us to represent and resemble Jesus? It's in his name we pray, amen.